Hebrews chapter 1, and we've really just gotten started in the first chapter of Hebrews. We've only gotten through a few verses, and this is about week four, I think, maybe week, yeah, I think it's about week four. Last time we considered a few interpretations, people have put on the words, this day have I begotten thee, there in verse five. To the Calvinists, this day referred to sometime in eternity past, long before Genesis 1. In eternity past, according to Calvinism, God made two decrees, two specific decrees. They're sometimes referred to as his eternal decrees. And uh, God decreed who he would save and redeem one day. He looked down through history and he looked down through time and he saw the entire multitude of the entire human race through all of time, and he decided which ones he will save. That was his first decree. His second decree was to officially, specifically, deliberately decide that he would not save everybody else. Those are his two eternal decrees. The... Um, the uh, decrees to salvation and the de decrees to uh, damnation or reprobation. But God made two specific decrees, and uh, he intentionally, deliberately decided who he will save, and he decided who he will not save. So that man has no free will whatsoever. Or they might say, you have free will, you can choose this, you can choose it. But the truth is, you can't. I can show you quotes from John Calvin's book, uh, or his uh, uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion, where he, in effect, says everything that happens, happens because it was so ordained by God. Everything. And when the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and that's a great Calvinistic verse, it has to then mean the steps of a bad man are also ordered by the Lord. That would be the, the uh, other side of the coin. God leads and directs some men to respond to the gospel, to go to church, to hear the Bible preached, to hear the plan of salvation offered and respond. And then God other, directs other men to go into a, uh, an X-rated bookstore and to get pornography and to do drugs and to get drunk. And he, he orders it. They do that because God so ordained them to do that. He chose before eternity began, or in eternity past, rather, that they should do those things. Man has no free will at all. You and I are simply acting out the roles, the parts that God has rewritten for us ahead of time. And, of course, it's rather insulting to you and I to be told, you have no choice in the matter. You have no free will. And um, if your kid rebels... It's because God foreordained them to rebel against you. If your child dies in infancy, it's because God chose that they should die in infancy. And uh, there, was no, there were no other factors uh, contributing to it whatsoever. This is why ultimate uh, extreme Calvinism, and I don't know how you can say, well, I'm moderate Calvinist and partly a Calvinist. Either you are or you aren't. Get off the pot or, you know, or Go. I'm using colloquialisms to illustrate my point, but either go or get off the pot. Either you are or you're not. There's no in-between, I'm partial Calvinist, I believe part of it. No, you can't just pick and choose bits and pieces that appeal to you right now. Either you believe it all or you don't believe any of it. And not believing any of it is probably the best route to take. But So the Calvinist would say in verse 5, this day have I begotten thee was a reference to something that happened, God um, making Jesus Christ to be his heir of all of his, uh, his kingdom, his eternity, in eternity past. To others, it refers to Christ's resurrection from the tomb. <clears throat> but let's read verses 5 and 6 together. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, 
and let all the angels of God worship him. So the reference to the first begotten into the world, verse 6, will naturally and quite easily match this day have I begotten thee, verse 5. We have to conclude then that this day referred to Christ's physical birth to Mary in Bethlehem. That's when that verse finds its fulfillment. John the Baptist was said to be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb, Luke 1, verse 15. But Jesus Christ was the first man ever to be born of the Holy Spirit. And there's a great distinction between those two. Mary was told by the angel, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Luke 1, 35. And verse 6, And let all the angels of God worship him. By the way, Jesus Christ is the only one who is truly worthy of worship. A lot of words that I suppose are used as synonyms of worship, to adore, to venerate, to regard, to honor, to respect, uh, and so forth. But the word worship, you know these Catholics that say, well, we don't worship Mary, we simply honor her. Let's debunk that one once and for all. You, If you take nothing else away from what I say today, take this away. Go back to the book of John chapter 5. Gail Ripplinger's got a new book uh, called The Dictionary Within the King James Bible. I haven't got a copy of it yet, but apparently she listed uh, a few thousand words found in the King James Bible and how the text of the Bible itself provides the definition for the word. John chapter 5 and... Let's see. Now don't tell me I can't find it here. Um, oh, okay. I'm looking right at it. Okay. John chapter 5. Here the Lord Jesus speaks. Well, start at verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. When you take that verse into consideration, the way the Bible defines the word honor means a lot more than just respect who they were. It means to worship. You don't just honor God the Father, you worship him. And like manner, you are to worship Jesus Christ. So don't ever let a Catholic get away with saying, well, we don't worship Mary, we simply honor her. Run them to this verse and say, well, according to the Bible's own use of the term, the word honor, to honor Christ or honor God, means a lot more than simply respecting them for their title, for their authority. It means to worship. And then I read to you from the private prayers of Pope John Paul II, a book down in my library, where he, he actually confessed multiple times to the, in his prayers to the Virgin Mary, we worship you. I read you his words on different occasions. And if I'm going to take your word or take the word of, of the most famous pope of the 20th century, I think I'm going to take his word as a more authoritative word on Catholicism than yours. You know, tell Henry or Fred at, at your workplace, listen, you might be a Catholic, but I'm going to take your pope's definition of the word worship, uh, use of the word worship over yours. And he said, you worship Mary. He didn't say we honor Mary. He said, we worship you. All right, back to our... Back to our chapter, Hebrews chapter 1. Um, and then he continues, verse 7. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. And you want to notice that wording. Angels are spirits, but the devil is also a spirit. Neither, neither are strictly physical beings. Uh, just a side note, go, if you will, back to Gospel of John, chapter 4. John, chapter 4. Here, Christ is dealing with the woman at the well. 
And he says in verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The so-called new and modern and reliable translations of the Bible all omit the word a. That one little word, that one little indefinite article, a. And so they all read God is spirit, including the New King James Version. The New King James Version is not the King James Bible. But they all say God is spirit. Well, simply saying God is spirit doesn't, doesn't teach anything. But the little indefinite article A, God is a spirit, it helps you to d differentiate between the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit within man, unclean spirits, or any other kind of spirit. That is amazing how the presence of one single letter word can make a big difference. And I've shown you Hebrews chapter 12, or Hebrews 10, rather, verse 12, uh, just moving a comma over eight spaces changed the entire meaning of the verse. One, in one version, it, it's anti-Catholic, but they move the comma over eight spaces, it becomes pro-Catholic. That's how, that's how fine-tuned the Word of God is. And so when we say we believe the Bible from cover to cover, we don't, it's, it's thrown out there piously by a lot of people who say, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. But they don't, they're not specific. Which Bible is the Word of God? Tell me, which Bible is the Word of God? Um, we believe this Bible is the Word, so much so, it's not our job to rewrite the Bible or to change the Bible. As I've said, the Bible's job is to change us. And, um, and if you approach the Word of God and say, I'm going to, I'm going to approach this Bible and believe that everything in it is there by the providence and the, 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 the will of God. And I'm not going to doubt any of it. I'm not going to question any of it. I'm just going to accept everything in it to be true. Now let's see if the Holy Spirit can begin to teach it to me as I read it. And I trust him to, to guide my thinking. Bob Jones would say, I never met the man, whether Catholic or atheist or Jew or Muslim, who didn't get saved and suddenly believe all the Bible to be the word of God. It's an amazing thing. Once you get a real dose of salvation, you're looking for the Word of God, and someone puts a book in your hands that this is the Word of God. You want to believe it. You want to grab hold of it. You want to hang on to it. But when someone comes along and says, well, that's a pretty good version, but this one's also a good version. That's a, that person's not a Bible believer. You go to any Calvary chapel that's large, you've got a big bookstore on their campus, you'll find in their books that they've got six, seven different translations of the Bible for sale. All that means is the pastor who's ultimately responsible for all that, he doesn't believe any single one of those Bibles is the perfect word of God. It's all relative. You say tomato, I say tomato. You say potato, I say potato, right? Let's call the whole thing off. And so they just, that's basically how they approach uh, the word of God. But, but for a Bible believer, he comes to this Bible and he accepts that every single word in there, whether it's italicized, I even accept the italics words as being part of the word of God. God's kept those italicized words in there for 400 years. I suppose he must have a purpose for them, so I'm going to accept those to be part of the word of God. And adding that one little indefinite article, A, God is a spirit, makes a world of difference in understanding the verse. But um, back here in... Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, and his ministers, a flame of fire. So angels are spirits. The devil is a spirit. Um, and that are to be distinguished between the spirit of God, the uh, rather the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit of a man within him, unclean spirits, fallen, and, and so forth. And his ministers, a flame of fire. I'll give you a few verses we can run to to reinforce that phrase, go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Genesis, chapter 3. Genesis 3 and verses 23 and 24. Genesis 3, 23 and 24. 
They say, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. There's your Star Wars lightsaber. If you want to find it in the Bible, it's right there. Uh, also go to 2 Kings chapter 2. Go forward to 2 Kings chapter 2. Second Kings and chapter 2. Here Elijah and Elisha are about to part. Second Kings 2 and verse 11 says, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. There's two cases where God sends some form of fire uh, to do his bidding, to do his service. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. And this one's probably clearer than the previous two. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, start at verse 6. 6, 7, and 8. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, notice, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That'll be the second advent of Jesus Christ, the glorious return of Jesus Christ, Revelation 19. And if you read Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, he describes an army of saints with God, at his, with Christ at his return, and that's undoubtedly the description of believers. Every Christian who's caught up at the rapture comes back at the end of the tribulation, at the visible, glorious return of Jesus Christ, now in glorified form and in supernatural, indestructible form, incorruptible, immortal, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. And you and I will be completely indestructible, an invincible army from heaven with Jesus Christ. It says specifically, however, here that the angels will come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your job will then be to enforce the, the law of Jesus Christ for the next thousand years after that. And we've talked about that before. If Let's suppose there are, um, I'm just going to pick a, a ballpark number. Let's suppose, just for the sake of uh, illustration, there's, maybe one and a half billion people who were saved from the thief on the cross until right now. I'm just picking a number. It might be more than that. Over the last 2,000, well, let's, just, well, let's say there's a one and a half to two billion people that have been saved by trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and nothing else. At the rapture of the saints, Every single one of them is going to receive a glorified body like the glorified body of Jesus. Boy, I can't wait for that. Yeah. Woo! They used to call it that great getting up morning. And that great getting up morning, fare thee well, fare thee well, and so forth. And, um, I, one of my, and I've told you before, one of my most favorite and corny gospel quartet songs is, was, is called When I Wake Up to Sleep No More. I like the, the turn of that phrase. They don't write phrases like that in songs like that. Country Western singers sometimes do. Uh, nobody can turn a phrase quite like a country Western singer can. <laughs> I hit her with my golf clubs because she really teed me off, right? How many have heard that one before? But um, <laughs> but. Well, you and I are, are waiting for these bodies to be changed. Part of us is seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. We're waiting for these bodies to be changed. And at the rapture of the saints, these bodies will be changed. From glory to glory, he leads me on. 
from grace to grace every day, one of the songs says. And um, so I'm waiting for this body to be changed. And when that happens, I will then join an army, an invincible, indestructible, supernatural arm. Do you know one of the, one of the recurring themes in movies of the last 20 years, 25 years, maybe longer than that, and which can't be denied, is the idea of aliens coming to the Earth. UFOs. And um, for some reason, all of this grainy footage of people's, from people's home videos or their cell phone cameras of unexplained objects in the sky, that's always intrigued me. And I don't want to waste a lot of time on it because you could spend forever watching dumb videos on the Internet that uh, present that. That's always intrigued me. Dr. Ruckman did some good Bible study on that very subject many years ago, on UFOs and so forth. But when the Lord Jesus returns, Revelation 19, and you and I uh, come with him, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, the fine linen is the righteousness of saints, Revelation 19, verse 8, and you and I are then made into an indestructible army, according to Joel 2, verses 1 through 11. Do you know what this earth is getting ready for? This earth is getting ready for an invasion from outer space. And they don't know it. They keep thinking, oh, it's going to be our friendly sky brothers to come and show us the way. And they deposited life here on our planet many, many centuries ago, and it, sprung, and it evolved into what we have now. That's got a lot of garbage. That's, that's the stuff that Richard Dawkins and a few other biologists want to postulate because they don't want to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So they come up with all kinds of harebrained, screwy ideas that aliens are responsible for life on this earth. But, um, and they've been watching us uh, for centuries to see how we manage our affairs and see if we can live peacefully and if we're going to blow ourselves up with nuclear war and so forth. That's a bunch of fantasy by the liberal left that somehow we're going to blow ourselves up with, with nuclear war and so forth. Let me tell you something. Man is not going to destroy this world no matter what he does. I'll tell you why. Jesus Christ is reserving that right for himself. He's going to destroy things. He's not coming back meek and mild, meek and lowly, riding on the full uh, on the full of an ass and so forth. He's going to be coming back as a as a conquering uh, general, leading an army from outer space to invade this earth and take it over for the next thousand years. No wonder there's a couple of prophecies that say uh, every face shall be turned to paleness or blackness. By the way, by the way, another little tidbit in English: the word black. And the word bleach have the same root. They have the same origin. So one verse in the Bible says, all faces shall gather blackness. I used to wonder what that meant. But then there's a companion verse that says, all faces shall gather paleness. So when you're scared and you're frightened and the blood rushes away from your cheeks, you're pale. And that's exactly what's going to happen to the multitudes on the earth when Jesus Christ comes back and judgment time has begun. It's just, it's good to be on the winning side. It's good to know the Savior, right? I'm so glad that November 5th, 1967, I prayed and asked God to forgive me. I was six years old. I didn't understand much. I knew I had disobeyed my dad and mom. But I knew if God had a right to judge somebody, he got a right to judge me. I didn't want to go to hell. And I remember praying, and all I could remember praying was, God, forgive me, forgive me. I was crying my eyes out. But something was happening in me right at that moment. The Holy Spirit was coming in. My name was being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I am now seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ from that moment till now. The Holy Spirit lives inside my body, and I'm waiting for this body to be changed so that my transformation will be made complete. And so are you if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. But um, the expression, his minister is a flame of fire. I'm going to try to move along here. That's not some inducement for preachers to smoke cigarettes, right? His minister is a flame of fire. 
There are actually, actually, if you want to play games with the Bible, a lot of people have done it. I gave you two verses uh, that deal with smoking in the Bible. Um, first of all, go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 16. This is just a side note. We'll get back to the main thing in just a moment. Proverbs 16. Uh, Proverbs 16, one quick verse there, verse 27 says, An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a burning fire. And I go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 24. Some of you are laughing, some of you are shaking your heads, can't believe I'd be that corny today, but... <laughs> Genesis 24, and uh, we'll start at verse 63. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming in, or coming rather. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, notice, she lighted off the camel. And the Bible say in the mouth of two or three witnesses? No, I'm just kidding. It didn't say Marlboro. It says camels. I mean, very specific about what brand. Um, I had a guy tell me in junior high school that motorcycles were in the Bible. And I said, really? He said, yeah, David's Triumph. <laughs> Triumph was an old motorcycle make. I don't even know if it's around anymore. Is it? How many know Honda cars are in the New Testament? Yeah, everybody knows that one. In Acts chapter 2, they gathered in one accord. All right, let's move on. Sometimes we talk about a believer being on fire for God, wanting to serve God or do something for Jesus Christ. And um, certainly God doesn't want Luke, in the book of Revelation, he, he um, chastises those or corrects those who are lukewarm because thou sayest I am... Uh, I'm not neither hot nor cold, but are lukewarm. I'll cast spew thee out of my mouth. And um, over there in Pomona, California, Dr. Ruckman has told this story more than once in his commentaries. In Pomona, California, just half a mile from where I work, is Central Baptist Church, right on town and the 10 freeway. And Pastor Betema, uh, who was the pastor there back in the 70s, he had a big work copied from Jack Hiles in Sunday School Building. He had 52 used school buses he had painted, and they were now church buses. He had 52 buses at one time going all around this area, taking kids home after Sunday school every Sunday afternoon. So he was a big church builder, and uh, I think they had about 1,500 to 2,000 people attending every Sunday morning there. And uh, he got saved under Dr. Ruckman's ministry, and uh, so he would have Dr. Ruckman come out to California and preach on occasion. But he also had all the Sword of the Lord and Jack Hiles and other guys come. By the way, it was Jack Hiles was here in Pomona preaching for Pastor Betema back in the 70s, maybe the early 80s. Uh, and he was staying at the Howard Johnson's, which was right along the 10 freeway in Indian Hill, and he said in his testimony that was he was while he was at that Howard Johnson's here on a preaching weekend, God began to deal with him about starting Hiles Anderson Bible College, and the rest is history after that. But but Doc Ruckman would also come out here and preach for Central Baptist Church and Pastor Betema. But Pastor Betema told the story of a, a young man that was a new Christian who got saved uh, under his preaching, hadn't been a, very, a Christian very long, and Pastor Baden was talking about the filth of this world and a Christian needing to be on fire to live for Jesus Christ and serve Jesus Christ. And right down there on Holt Avenue, near Holt and Gary Avenue, there was an X-rated bookstore. This is back in the 70s. And this young man took it upon himself to go to that bookstore with a can of gasoline and began pouring around inside the store and he was going to strike a match and torch the place because he wanted to be on fire for Jesus Christ. He was really loosely interpreting that, that, that expression. And, uh, but apparently the matches were 
not wet or for some reason he couldn't get him to strike. And by that time, the, the owner had called the police and the police came and arrested the guy. And Pastor Bainham got him out of jail. But uh, that's talking about doing something on fire for Jesus Christ. And the reason I know exactly all the details is because that site where that uh, dirty place used to be is now, ha now has a El Pollo Loco sitting on it. And it's right over the fence from my job during the week. I go there quite for lunch quite often. So, so I know exactly where it was. I, knew, I, I remember driving by as a, as a kid, 15, 16. I just got my license and seeing that place. I knew where it was at. Years have come and gone. Now it's a, an El Pollo Loco. Um, they're serving flame broiled chicken, I guess. Now. <laughs> but... Um, which is much better than which was much better than uh, torching the place. Um, the the grill master, the flame master, whatever his name is. Anyway, verse eight, back to our text, Hebrews one, and I've rambled quite a bit. Uh, Hebrews one, verse eight says, "But unto the Son, He saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom." The quote is from Psalm 45. If you will, run back to Psalm 45, and let's read a few verses there. Keep your finger here, of course, in Psalm 45. Psalm 45, and let's read the first seven verses there. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This is a very strong, actually one of the strongest texts um, here in Hebrews 1, on the deity of Jesus Christ. And naturally, it's going to meet with resistance by the modern so-called better versions, etc. But if you notice that passage there in Psalm 45, verses 1 to 7, there are two people he's, he's referring to, one directly and one indirectly. He's referring to the king, and he's referring to God, who blessed the king and raised him up and elevated him. But he says there in verse, uh, I think it's verse 7, thy throne, or rather, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. He calls the king God. And it's repeated almost verbatim here in Hebrews 1, verse 8. It's one of the strongest texts in the New Testament on the, the deity of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then lastly received up into glory. But uh, because it's such a strong verse on the deity of Jesus Christ, naturally it gets met with resistance by people who want to water down or downplay the deity of Jesus Christ. Let me... I brought two books here to illustrate this. This is the Revised Standard Version, 1952, by the copyright National Council of Churches. Hebrews 1, verse 8, they say, But of the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then footnote says, Or God is thy throne. That makes no sense. God is your throne. I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. But, they, but, the, but the sentence construction 
is very solid in English and in Greek before it. But we don't care about Greek or Hebrew. We have the word of God in English. We have the original English, right? <laughs> but here's a JW Bible. And uh, not willing simply just to put it in a footnote, they actually rewrite Hebrews 1 verse 8. But with reference to the Son, quote, God is your throne forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. By the way, I'm no English major. I'm not an expert at English prose or language, but I recognize bad English when I see it. <laughs> the word righteousness, it flows out of the English speaker's mouth more smoothly than uprightness. It's like the words John 11.35, two words, Jesus wept. That's an elegant word. Jesus wept. The JWs take those two words and, and convert it into five words and take those three syllables and make six syllables. And their version says, Jesus gave way to tears. That sounds horrible. That, that sounds bad. To an English speaker, it sounds terrible because it is terrible. Some of the worst English text, English prose you'll ever find is a JW Bible. But rather than simply um, translating it as it should have been translated, they rewrite it to say, God is your throne. What does that mean? Is Jesus sitting on God's lap? You know, you get up and down, get up and down. I don't know what that means. God is your throne. But the scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. That's clearly a reference to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Go to two verses and then we'll be done for today. Run back to Psalm 110. Psalm 110, and two verses there, verses 5 and 6. I'm trying to move along here. Psalm 110, verses 5 and 6 for right now. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. And also go to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2. And begin with the very first verse. The word that, I, that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Well, that's the scepter of righteousness. That's the scepter of Christ's kingdom. He's going to rule over this earth for a thousand years, and then into eternity by extension after that. 